one. And thank you very much for joining us tonight for what I think is going to be uh, an interesting and informative and very important discussion. Uh, what we are seeing in this country at a moment of mass income and wealth inequality, uh, at a time when real wages for working families uh, have been stagnant for almost 50 years, uh, at a time when some 90 million Americans don't have any health insurance or they are underinsured, at a time when 45 million people are dealing with student debt and when we have a housing crisis, when we have a whole set of crises facing the working families of this country. What we are seeing, appropriately enough, is a significant increase in labor organizing activity. We're seeing historic advances being made at Amazon. We're seeing workers all over the country organized at Starbucks shops. We're seeing Apple being organized. Uh, we're seeing in my home city and in other parts of the country, residents, medical doctors and hospitals organizing. Uh, we're seeing uh, adjunct professors on college campuses organizing. Uh, so what we are seeing is an upsurge in blue collar organizing in white collar organizing. Uh, and we have seen in the last year a number of very important strikes where workers have demanded economic justice and the need for decent wages and working conditions and benefits. So that's the moment that we're in. And I think if we want to understand how we can best go forward, it's always important to understand where we came from. What is the history of the trade union movement in America? And this is something, needless to say, that the ruling class of this country does not talk about terribly often, what we owe to those people who stood up under tremendous opposition, uh, sometimes getting shot, sometimes going on strike for months and months, scarcely any food to feed their kids. Uh, we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude, and we have to understand and acknowledge and appreciate what they have done. Uh, we have to remember that during the 1930s, in the middle of the Depression, uh, at the early part of the Depression, labor membership had gone down from some 5 million workers to 3 million workers. That was because of the Depression. But during the 30s, uh, under the leadership of FDR and a number of factors, we saw a huge upsurge in labor organizing. We saw enormously important strikes in steel, in auto industry, in textiles. Uh, all over the, the, our economy. Workers stood up and they fought back. And uh, right now we may, I hope, be at that moment uh, where working people understand that we need an economy that works for all, not just the few, that it is absurd that during the pandemic when thousands and thousands of workers died, so-called essential workers, because they had to go to work, they produced the food that we needed, they did the transportation. They worked in hospitals. They died. And yet billionaires during that period saw a $2 trillion increase in their wealth. So I think you are seeing a rising up in this country against this kind of injustice and the demand for decent wages and benefits. And let me uh, start off uh, the program by just reading, a, I, I think, a very good quote um, from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., that he gave, and, and people don't know this, and I know we'll talk about it tonight, uh, King worked very closely uh, with labor unions in the civil rights struggle and was a strong advocate of labor unions. This is what he said uh, on October 7th, 1965. He said, and I quote, the labor movement was the principal force that transformed misery and despair into hope and progress. Out of its bold struggles, economic and social reform gave birth to unemployment insurance, old age pensions, government relief for the destitute, and above all, new wage levels that meant not mere survival, but a tolerable life. The captains of industry did not lead this transformation. They resisted it until they were overcome. When in the 30s, the wave of union organization crested over the nation, it carried to secure shores, not only itself, but the whole society. Civilization began to grow in the economic life of man, and a decent life with a sense of security and dignity became a reality rather than a distant dream. So 
in other words, unions fulfill many important goals. Obviously, when you have a contract, you can negotiate for decent wages and working conditions, uh, and that's terribly important. Uh, but it does something else. It says to the world that you are more than just a vassal for your boss. That your boss can't do anything he or she wants to you. You have certain rights. You have certain dignity. And that you and your fellow workers are going to stand together in solidarity to fight for a decent life. And what unions did, and we'll discuss this tonight, is not only engaged in strong collective bargaining, as Dr. King points out, who want to know why you have Social Security, why we have Medicare, why we have Medicaid, why we have you know, a 40-hour work week, why we have time and a half for overtime. These didn't come from the employers. They didn't come from the corporate world. They came from the struggles of workers. So it's important to know where we came from if we want to know where we are going. And tonight I am delighted to be joined by uh, four individuals who are extremely uh, knowledgeable, have written a whole lot, taught a whole lot about American labor history. They are Toby Higby, who is a professor of history and labor studies at UCLA. Uh, Dana uh, Kaldemeyer, who is an assistant professor of history at Alabama A&M University in Huntsville. Kent Wong, who is the director of the UCLA Labor Center, where he teaches courses in labor studies and Asian American studies. Uh, Dr. Cornell West, who is a philosopher, author, activist, and a professor of philosophy and Christian practice at Union Theological Seminary, and holds the title of Professor Emeritus at Princeton. So let us begin uh, with uh, Toby Higby. Uh, Dr. Higby, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, uh, Bernie. It's a, a real pleasure to be part of this important conversation. Um, I've been teaching labor history at UCLA for the past 15 years, and our students today are the most eager I've ever seen so far to learn about organizing both the history and the practical applications. And as you know, the share of Americans who say they support unions and would want to be in a union is much higher than the share of Americans who actually are in a union. And that's because it's extremely difficult to organize unions in the United States. That's something we have in common today with uh, the American past. It has always been quite difficult, except for a relatively brief period. So even with all this great incredible organizing going on today, Starbucks, Amazon, elsewhere, there's still this huge gap between the those who want to be represented by unions and those who are. And everyone's trying to figure out, as you suggest, how, how do we fill that gap? How do we make unions grow big enough to be a countervailing power to big business? And what can we learn from the past, if anything, to help us today? And to answer that question, there's a lot of different ways to do that, but I'm just, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm gonna go back to the 1920s, uh, which was a boom time for business, but also a, a very bad time for unions. It was a time for unions, they were, they were divided by race, by ethnicity, by gender, by skill, uh, by immigration status. And they had very little influence, frankly, in the central industries. They were a non-player in the central industries of the American economy. So a little bit like today, the dark times where unions were very weak in the 1920s, but that was also the period where organizers were beginning to piece together the strategies that would help them break through in the 1930s and 40s. So somebody I admire from this period is uh, named Rose Pesoda. She was a Jewish immigrant garment worker from what today is Ukraine. She was a strong woman working in the macho movement culture of trade unionism. She was a creative organizer who took on fiercely anti-union employers, and she won. Pesota had very little formal schooling, which was common for workers in the 1920s. Um, but she saw the labor movement itself as a kind of educational process. As she told fellow workers and organizers in 1927, there isn't one working class, she said. She was explaining that people are divided 
into sometimes hostile camps. The movement has to organize in every different community on its own terms before they can bring people together. And she brought that idea to Los Angeles in 1933, uh, a city that was fiercely, notoriously anti-union town. Uh, and she led a general strike of garment workers. The, uh, that, were, that workforce was divided between white workers and Spanish speaking Mexican and Mexican American workers between Anglo and Jewish workers between men and women, but she found a way to bring them together to fight uh, to learn that they were better fighting together than against one another. So that unionization is like an educational process. Uh, a. Philip Randolph, the leader of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which in the 1920s and 30s was the largest African-American uh, union in the United States, made a similar point. He likened the normal mindset of workers to that of, of, of a pedestrian walking on a crowded New York City sidewalk. And he said that, uh, you know, when you're walking like that, basically, you don't really see all the other people. You just find your way naturally trying not to bump into anybody to get to your destination. And what he thought when he was organizing the March on Washington movement originally in the 1940s, and then it came to fruition in the 1960s uh, for jobs and freedom to fight against discrimination in the workplace, he thought we have to... Uh, put people into motion to get them to change the way they see each other. And they would then recalibrate what they thought they owed to each other as fellow human beings. So again, the movement was an educational process that would change people's mindset. And my point is, to, is that when we focus, sometimes we like to focus on the big upsurges of labor unity, like the 1930s or in the 1960s. Um, but sometimes we get fooled into thinking that workers are somehow naturally united. They aren't. Organizers brought them together, little by little, preparing the ground culturally, psychologically for the big breakthroughs. America is a always been a multiracial society, a multiracial working class divided by white supremacy, by machismo, by skill and education, by religion and ideology, more and more today by citizenship status. There isn't one natural working class, as Pesota said, solidarity isn't automatic. It takes work. Uh, and that's what organizers do, and that pays off big time. Um, yeah, sure thing. Professor of History at Alabama A&M. Dana, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, for those of you all who don't know, I study um, Gilded Age history, which is basically history in the 1800s, the later part of the 1800s and the Progressive Era, which um, kind of goes forward into the 20th century. And I, I kind of want to echo what Toby was talking about here whenever um, he, he mentions the challenges that people faced whenever they were trying to organize and uh, really establish uh, organized labor that would kind of have success. Um, in the United States in the 1860s, 1870s going forward, uh, labor unions were not very strong. They were just kind of starting out. They were trying to figure out how to um, really function. And they had so many challenges that they needed to overcome. Workers worked in terrible working conditions, um, easily lost their lives, and, and nobody really thought twice about it. Um, I've seen instances where companies um, had mine explosions and um, they, they knew that there was a good chance that workers were still alive, but they decided that it cost too much money to stage a rescue effort. And so they decided to just seal up the mine, declare everybody dead and reopen a new mine elsewhere. And of course, the families of these workers are irate. You know, they, they have family that's probably still alive there. But the bottom line at the time was profit. And it just wasn't profitable for them to rescue workers whenever they could easily hire someone else. And 
So labor unions saw that this was something that they needed to address, but trying to figure out how to address that, how to establish a clear movement was a bit of a challenge. And so they're really kind of building it up from, from basically nothing in the Gilded Age, trying to handle working conditions, wages. Um, some people were working completely for free in the Gilded Age. They weren't earning cash. They were um, getting coupons or getting credit. Um, and some people just were working for free in the hopes that eventually they could get a paying job with a company. Um, this is, um, these are conditions that we would think today are just completely insane, but that was life in the Gilded Age. And so whenever unions formed, you had organizations like the National Labor Union, the Knights of Labor, um, what was then called the American Federation of Labor. Um, these guys in the Gilded Age are really trying to figure out how they could bring about this change. And um, ultimately, they had a ton of problems that they, they needed to overcome with that. It wasn't just um, racism and nativism among the workers themselves. Uh, people were divided on what kind of goals they needed to achieve first, because you can't achieve it all at once whenever you don't have a clear movement going yet. Um, so prioritization was a big problem. And then of course, um, corporate and government just you know, lack of support across the board for unionization and outright hostility became something that was really difficult for, uh, for unions to overcome. And so, um, I know that like, whenever people talk about the Gilded Age, there are a couple of strikes that always kind of stick out, things like the railroad strikes or the garment workers strikes that, um, that yielded a lot of success. The United Mine Workers of America had a great strike in the early uh, 20th century where they were kind of able to finally sit at the table and negotiate with, with corporations. But um, it's important to also kind of look at those failures that they also endured during the Gilded Age and kind of remember that the problems that we face today are actually a lot more similar to what they were facing in the Gilded Age than, than they are different. Um, and so that's, that's the big takeaway that I kind of want to hammer here um, because very few people are familiar with the movements of the Gilded Age. And so it's kind of important to get that big um, kind of context to understand what's going on here. They had so much that they needed to achieve. And um, at sometimes it, it seemed like it was just too much to do all at once. And it was really easy for workers to get to, to demoralized from it. Good job. Uh, thank you, Dana. Let's go to Kent Wong, who's at the UCLA Labor Center. Kent, thanks for being with us. Thanks so much, Bernie. It's great to be with you. And we appreciate your leading voice and activism for economic justice. It was so great to hear uh, my friends Toby and Dana to talk about the rich history of the U.S. working class and the U.S. and the rich history of the U.S. labor movement. Uh, and I want to bring it up to speed in terms of what is going on today. Uh, I teach uh, labor studies and ethnic studies here at UCLA. Um, but prior to that, I was a union attorney for the Service Employees International Union in Los Angeles at a time of dy dynamic change when we had a new working class that was emerging and that was organizing for power. So my union helped to uh, bring about the Justice for Janitors campaign that reinvigorated the energy of the immigrant working class of Los Angeles and led to unprecedented victories in organizing the janitorial industry. We saw the hotel workers rising forward as a, a force for change and progress. We saw the home care organizing campaign launched by black women that successfully organized 74,000 home care workers, mainly women of color. And today, more than 400,000 home care workers in the state of California are under union contract because of the heroism of these Black women who launched this campaign. And so the voice of labor today is growing stronger. Workers across the country are organizing in unprecedented numbers. And the positive image of unions is at a 50-year high. So this is a huge opportunity to advance change and to advance social justice unionism. We have seen in Los Angeles that immigrant workers have been at the forefront of some of the most significant organizing victories that we have seen. And we see a bankrupt immigration system where 11 million people are locked in an apartheid style system uh, where their undocumented status uh, uh, denies them basic human rights and human dignities. We call these workers essential workers because they plant 
and pick the fruits and vegetables we eat. We call them essential workers because they work in our warehouses and in our fast food restaurants and in our hotels. And yet they are treated anything but as essential workers. They are treated as disposable workers subjected to corporate greed. We have billionaires who are making billions in profits during the pandemic. And yet working people are suffering to barely make a living. So this is the current context that we are in when we need to step up and organize like never before, bring unions to the American workplace to democratize the working class and to democratize the workplace that is anything but democratic. So I am filled with tremendous hope and energy. Young workers, workers of color, women workers are leading the charge to transform the US labor movement and to take on the ugly corporate greed that dominates so much of our society today. Last but certainly not least uh, is Cornell West, who is a professor of philosophy at Union Theological Seminary. Cornell, thanks so much for being with us. Cornell, you're... Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? No, indeed. I'm just, it's always a blessing to be with Brother Bernie and to be here with my distinguished colleagues, with Brother Toby and Sister Dana and Brother Kenneth said, I think it's so very, very important. One of the great paradoxes of our moment is that we're right on the brink of a, a renaissance of the labor movement. And at the same time, witnessing escalating neo-fascist forces, not just against workers' rights, but women's rights and voting rights of Black people and immigrant rights. And so we have to be able to keep both of these ideas in our mind at the same time and retain the ability to envision a better future. And I think anytime you talk about the labor movement, you're talking about three different levels. You're talking about new ways of seeing, which is both a moral way of orienting yourself in the world. You have to be able to, to see working class social misery along with the misery of other people. You had to be able to see class struggle and class conflict, to see corporate greed and its connection to that social misery. But, did you, but you need analytical lens too. An analytical lens is ways of trying to understand the truth of the suffering. How does the suffering come about? How do we understand the ways in which power operates? So you got moral lens, you got analytical lens, but last but not least, institutional lens, which is to say, you're looking at the world in a certain way as it connects to the organizational ties that you have that lead you to engage in certain kind of courageous action. So you need all three of these levels simultaneously and talking about the, the trade union movement. This is very important with the trade union movement too often, it's viewed as some kind of ghettoized activity isolated from other ways of resisting against domination, other ways of resisting any kind of corporate power, patriarchal power, white supremacist power, homophobic power, transphobic power, any kind of power of the status quo. And part of our challenge is how do we attempt to highlight all three levels of these new ways of seeing and acting mediated with deep feelings of solidarity given what is in place right now, which is deeply reactionary ways of conceiving the world, Republican Party, and liberal, neoliberal ways of viewing the world too often in the Democratic Party that don't want to talk about corporate power, don't want to talk about corporate greed, don't want to talk about militarism abroad, don't want to talk about the most progressive voices, figures, institutions in the labor movement. And so it's a matter of mapping where we are at present. And most importantly, as was noted with all three of these very important voices and figures, understanding that hope is a verb as much as a virtue. You've got to stay in motion. What kind of organization are you working with? What kind of analytical lens are you using? What kind of moral, and I would even add spiritual power because the role of the arts in the in the, in the working class movement is something that we also want to want to uh, at least acknowledge and to, to know. Brother Kent was saying before how 
Now there's new labor study centers all around California. That's important in terms of the public discourse, the academic discourse, the intellectual discourse, the analytical lens, crucial. And, and that's a result of what? Labor movement pushing through on the intellectual front. Same would be true on the artistic front, same would be true on the political organizational front. So it's a blessing to be here and I look forward to the questions and queries. I always can't wait to learn and laugh and re-engage. Thank you so much. Um, let me start off with a kind of a softball question, but an important question. Historically, why have, what were the conditions in the 20s, before that, in the 30s, today, that made workers want to join a union? Why is today, as I think maybe Toby said, unions, are unions more popular now than they have been for many, many decades? So why do people want to participate in the union movement historically? And what have we learned from that? Who wants to jump in on that one? Bernie, I'll jump in quickly. Uh, I think to echo what uh, Dr. West said was hope is a lot to it because one of the, obviously in the Great Depression, uh, people were suffering greatly. But uh, when the labor movement was able to lay out a potential path forward that seemed actionable and could work, it gave people a lot more hope. So that was the the little victories, you know, like we're seeing today. Uh, those little victories give people uh, hope and it leads more people into the movement. That's, that's what I would add to that. Dana, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, one thing that I've seen in the 1930s, but then also um, before that is just sheer desperation. Um, people saying, you know, what do I have to lose? Uh, what I have right now isn't great. I, I, I don't know what else to do. I might as well try this. And so it, it really is, um, there, there is a hope that, you know, maybe this is going to be the, the thing that kind of gets them out of the, the troubles that they face. But it's also just this, um, the, the sheer hardships that people are enduring that um, kind of uh, kind of get them to say, you know what, I, I'm going to go ahead and take a chance with this anyway. I also want to bring in the current, I also want to bring in the current reality. We are entering the third year of a pandemic. Over 1 million people in the United States have died and millions and millions of people throughout the world. But let us be clear, that the suffering is not equally felt. And if you look at the impact on working class communities, if you look at the impact on immigrants, if you look at the impact of communities of color, it has been devastating. And how could it be that you would have a private space race being led by the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks of the world who with their obscene wealth, instead of using that resource to share the vaccine, with developing countries, use it to burn through billions of dollars in a private space race. This is the obscenity of corporate greed in action. And I think that a new generation of workers in the United States understand that corporations are not representing their interests and that essential workers are being at, treated as dispendable workers and that for young workers today, they have a very poor opportunity to find a good job because they don't have access to good union jobs that in generations past created the middle class in this country. So in that spirit, more workers are turning towards unionization. I think hope is always something to be understood in, re in relation to what William James called live options. And once certain options are viewed as no longer able to deliver or exhausted, people look for some other options. And we're at a moment now where it's clear that the neoliberal option is not delivering. And if the, if, if the only option is the right wing option, moving toward the neo-fascist option, then they'll, they'll opt for it, not so much because they believe in everything that the gangster Trump believes or whatever, but they're looking for an alternative. See, the Brother Bernie was an option and they so many were open to birth. 
so that all of us as human beings are in contact with various limited options. And if the left, if progressives cannot provide a live option, which is exactly what the labor movement in LA was able to do, exactly what those labor studies programs more and more are going to be doing in California, we need it on a national level. And so in that sense, it's not a, just a question of all of us coming together, multiracial, multigender, of course we need that. But it's got to be concrete enough that it's perceived as a live option given the fact that what's in place now is simply colossal failure for so many poor and working people. One of the points that all of you have made is there has been throughout this history and throughout our history, and I would argue today, a level of desperation and pain and suffering that the ruling class and the media do not acknowledge. I mean, right now, I don't know how many folks out there know that in the richest country in the history of the world, where during the pandemic, billionaire class, fewer than a thousand, saw their wealth increase by $2 trillion, you got half of our workforce living paycheck to paycheck. People can't afford to go to a doctor. You got a half a million people who are homeless, on and on and on. In other words, the first thing we have got to do when we talk about the need to build the union movement is to recognize the kind of desperation and suffering that exists today. Now, way back when, you had children working in factories, not going uh, to school. Of course, you had the incredible racism and the sexism that existed. Women couldn't get uh, the jobs they needed. Uh, the African-American community was living in apartheid. That's part of our history, which we have got to discuss and we have got to understand. All right, so let me now ask the next question. Uh, what, have, what have been the successes of the trade union movement. How is America today better because of the struggles of workers and their unions? Who wants to take a shot at that one? I can dive in here. Uh, I think some of the biggest things that you see really are things that we take for granted today. Uh, things like, um, safer working conditions, an eight hour workday, minimum wage. These were things that organized labor had fought for for generations by the time we actually secured them. Hmm? Talk a little bit about, because I don't think a lot of people know this, talk about the conditions that workers worked under back in the 20s or earlier than that. You talked about improved safety conditions. Well, what, what existed before? Oh, in workplaces, uh, there would be no guardrails and factory. You could you you could lose a limb, you could lose fingers, you could lose your life. Um, nothing there to make sure that mines wouldn't catch fire or explode. Um, children would come out of factories completely maimed, and um, nobody really seemed to care about that, especially in in the Gilded Age. Um, and you had activists like. Uh, Mother Jones, who really kind of took this um, to to the public and and really kind of pushed the issue to kind of make people aware. Um, but if people hadn't been there to really kind of call the nation's attention to what was going on in the workplaces, um, these these problems would have lasted a lot longer. Uh, workers would um, they would work for an entire you know pay period, but then once payday came, the company would say, "Well, we're not going to pay you this um, this time, so you're just going to have to continue working. And then if you're still here at the next pay period, then we'll pay you for um, for the past two pay periods. And if you don't like it, then you can leave, but you're not going to get your paycheck now." And workers had no recourse for that. And so those are some of the problems that um, that workers faced uh, as far as conditions in the workplace. I completely agree. I completely agree, Dana, with all of those uh, conditions that you cited, and many of those uh, were uh, uh, topics of organizing and reasons that unions formed and joined to improve better wages and better working conditions. The reality, however, is that everything that you described exists today in the U.S. workplace. 
We have farm workers in the Central Valley of California who are poisoned by pesticides in the fields because the growers have no interest in spending extra money to find clean ways of um, uh, providing safety for the workers. We have warehouse workers today who are working in 110, 100 degree temperatures for Amazon. Uh, one of my students at UCLA, his father died from being exposed to COVID on the job at Amazon and Amazon did everything they could to cover up uh, the responsibility and to avoid notifying his coworkers about COVID outbreaks within the warehouses. Here in Los Angeles, we have the largest sweatshops in the country where garment workers to this day are working less than minimum wage to uh, clothes that we wear every day. So these unfortunately are not conditions that are in the past. These are conditions today that US corporations are directly responsible for and they refuse to take responsibility for the unsafe, unhealthy, sub-minimum wage conditions that exist in America today. All right, let me follow Kent's point uh, by getting into the role of corporate America. One of the things that we are seeing today, and of course this is not new, uh, is that even when workers are successful, as in the case of Amazon uh, in Staten Island, in the case of Starbucks shops all over the country, they are successful in organizing a union. What the company refuses to do is to negotiate a first contract. And they hope that by stalling and stalling and stalling, uh, workers will become demoralized and companies like Starbucks or Amazon, the turnover rate is enormously high. So they hope that the momentum for a union will dissipate. Uh, if you guys could for a moment talk about, and, and in, you know, in extreme cases back in the 20s, workers were shot down when they stood up and fought back. Right? Colorado, they were mowed down. You got the National Guard coming in. You got goons. Famous picture of Walter Ruther at the UAW being beaten up by a bunch of company goons. Talk about the role that corporations played and play in fighting the workers' constitutional right to organize a union. Who wants to jump in? That's a big one, Bernie, and it's been going on for a long time. So uh, let me just say that I think, you know, the when the National Labor Relations Act was passed in 1935, it was in certain ways revolutionary in the sense that it put the federal government on the side of collective bargaining for the first time. Labor unions had been sort of illegal in a sense, uh, and that's why they were so subjected to uh police violence, but also judges uh, passing injunctions to prevent them from organizing and, you know, thug violence, kind of fascistic violence. But one of the things that happened in the 1970s and 80s as the federal government began withdrawing support for the labor board was that employers learned anew how to manipulate the system. And so uh, that's why we have, we've come to a point where even if you can struggle the, your way to getting a contract or a, a union, winning a union election, it's very difficult to get to that first contract because employers uh, figured out a way to game the system and they can get away with it uh, through their legal teams to de delay for sometimes 10 years, fire people who are organizers and maybe 10 years later, they'll get their jobs back. Well, they don't, that won't work. You need to get your job back right away. Instead of goons, they hire lawyers and consultants, right? Different style, I guess to jump in on the role that uh, the corporate world has historically played in trying to prevent workers from organizing. Bonnell? Yeah, I, I want to accent something that we did have in the past in the labor movement, working class culture that we don't have now, which is we had labor newspapers, we had labor clubs, we had labor at the world through the lens of what was happening to labor. It used to be labor pages in the bourgeois in the mainstream newspapers. Now it's just business pages. So the perspective of how you see the world is, is pro-capitalist, pro-business, pro-greed, 
pro the very thing that we're fighting against. And this is also true in the music. It's also true in the social life. So what we need here is to accent ways in which corporate media don't allow the, our fellow citizens to look at the world through the lens of what is happening to precious working people. And that's a, that's, that, this is why. Washington Post, it's not CNN, this is us. <laughs> but see now, I mean, there's some other, there's some organizations out there, some, but, but it's so very important to, to accent it seems to me. Which I find amusing. You got real wages in this country have been more or less stagnant for the last 50 years, despite a huge increase in technology and productivity. You got, as I mentioned earlier, half the people living paycheck to paycheck, people falling behind. Have you ever seen the corporate media talk about the word, the phrase, working class? How do you have a working class if it's not even acknowledged to exist? How do you have a ruling class if nobody acknowledges that reality? You got three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of America. They run our government. They run the economy. But we don't have a ruling class, right? I guess not. All right. Who wants to my rant? Rant free. I, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you, Bernie, that there is a, a very deliberate and conscious effort on the part of uh, the corporate elite to undermine this whole notion of a working class and absolutely to undermine working class solidarity. Um, the fact that Walmart refuses to call its workers, workers calls them associates. The fact that Uber and Lyft do not wanna call their drivers workers, they call them independent contractors, which is a misnomer and is it a, a direct assault on their workers' rights because as independent contractors, they are not allowed minimum wage. They are not allowed. Starbucks workers are partners. You didn't know that. That's right. right. They and Starbucks Howard Schultz are partners making billions together. How do you like that? But when Amazon workers organize in Staten Island <laughs> and when Starbucks workers organize in more than 100 uh, Starbucks uh, locations around the country, the corporate union busters are right there to do all they can to undermine their workers' democratic right to form and join unions. And so this whole uh, obfuscation of class solidarity is critical. Uh, one thing that I do wanna point out, and you know, Brother Cornell's, Cornell West has raised this, that you know, public education was fought for and won by the labor movement. And higher education, especially public colleges and universities are paid for by working class tax dollars. And so, Two weeks ago, we secured a huge victory that is a victory for the working class. We uh, have now received a $13 million annual augmentation as a result of the leadership and courage of State Senator Maria Elena Dorasso for advancing this initiative in order to expand and grow nine labor centers throughout the University of California system in the coming months. So I guarantee you the things that Cornette West were talking about in terms of growing a working class culture growing a media and communications profile for uh, the needs of workers, that these are things that we will be putting into place in the coming months. I just want to reiterate, I don't know why, I think Cornell made the point, maybe Kent made it, that I'll give you an example, fresh on my mind, very fresh. Uh, I submitted an op-ed to CNN, and it was on an issue we're dealing with right now at this moment, is that Congress is about to give $52 billion in corporate welfare to the microchip industry with no strings attached, just a free check. And um, I raised concerns about, wrote an op-ed about it, and CNN said, yeah, I like it, except you gotta put in a paragraph telling us about all the good things that Intel has done. Okay, in other words, you know, they have to protect their corporate interests. So we, you know, we're not gonna have an op-ed there. Um, I want to get back to another point. I want to get back to two points. And maybe, Cornell, you jump in on this one. I don't think there is much knowledge in this country about the role that progressive trade unionism played, uh, not only in the civil rights struggle, but even before that, uh, that you had unions 
that had that were reasonably well integrated uh, before that became socially acceptable. Uh, Quinn, I'll talk a little bit about the role of unions, uh, fighting racism, uh, civil rights movement. Well, one is that anytime you talk about black people, Asians, you talk about uh, Spanish speaking Mexicans or uh, Latin Latinos, you're talking about people who are overwhelmingly working people. So that you already, from the very beginning, must be able to think simultaneously the fact that women dominated, subjugated, the majority of women, working people, black folks that way, Asians the same way. So that even when we talk about intersectionality, I know that's a very fashionable term and I love my dear sister Kimberly Crenshaw very deeply, but if you understand it solely in an abstract spatial way, rather than concretely in the bodies, in the lived experiences of everyday people, you're gonna think it's something just added on, this plus, this, plus, this, no. It's simultaneously in the very lived experience of folks. So that, for example, Brother Kent has just been working with many, many years, the great James Lawson, who goes hands in hand with Fannie Lou Hamer, who goes hand in hand with Martin Luther King Jr. Why is James Lawson such a powerful force for good based on vision and courage when it comes to the labor movement, when it comes to struggles against white supremacy, struggles against male supremacy, struggles against homophobia, and he's a Christian minister. Well, he's got certain moral orientations. He looks at the world through a certain way, and he's in solidarity with struggling people in a courageous way. And therefore, when we talk about the labor movement and struggles against racism and sexism, we would add imperialism too, in terms of what America's done in Latin America and various parts of the world. We have these exemplars. And one of the great things about these labor studies is people can see things more clearly when they see exemplary movements, exemplary institutions, and exemplary individuals who looked at the world differently than the mainstream. CNN, MSNBC, we won't even talk about Fox News in terms of their, the, the, you know, the ugliness there, but we're talking about mainstream perception. On that one. Dana, you've been silent for seven minutes. Jump in. Yeah, I, I can definitely say something here. You know, um, coming from the Gilded Age, whenever you see so much division along um, ethnic and, and racial lines, you do see labor organizations trying to cobble together some sort of unity among the working class, kind of like uh, what Dr. West is talking about here. And um, from you have two competing perspectives almost um, on one hand from uh, non-white workers from women workers they see organizations like um, the labor unions that they join as a vehicle to um, achieve not just workplace justice but broader social change too and so you see workers calling on organizations to take a stand on things like lynching and and take a stand on things like um, legalized segregation, which happened in the Gilded Age. And, um, and so you see these, these workers expecting the unions to take a stand on these issues. But at the same time, uh, these unions aren't immune to the, um, you know, the racism of the time period. And so while they have the rank and file that are pushing for all these changes, you also see the union leadership kind of pulling on the reins saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I, I don't know if we want to get involved in that fight. We just wanna work on the working conditions. And so it's the, trying to find that foothold in the Gilded Age made things very, very difficult and that um, continued into the progressive era as well. My impression is that in the 40s and the 50s, 60s, there were a lot of unions who were actively involved in the fight against segregation and racism. Uh, and that there was a reason why Dr. King often spoke to labor unions. What am I missing here? Is that correct? Kent? What you said is absolutely true, that in uh, the 1960s, and Brother Cornell West uh, lifted up the extraordinary contributions of Reverend James Lawson Jr., who was a leader of the Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike that brought together the civil rights movement and the labor movement around a common agenda. So. Indeed, you had many progressive labor leaders uh, back in the uh, 1960s who aligned with uh, broader issues of uh, civil rights against segregation and for human liberation. So there have always been those trends within the labor movement that have embraced 
a social justice vision for the future. What Dana said is also true, that there have been more conservative forces within the labor movement, and they exist to this day, that have shied away from taking positions on issues like reproductive justice, issues like LGBTQ rights, issues like immigrant rights, because they say that those go beyond the scope of what we need to be focused on as a labor movement, and that we should only focus on bread and butter issues of our members. In my view, the finest hour of unions, the finest hour of the labor movement is when they have embraced a broader notion of social justice unionism that understands that the liberation of all people is a just demand that unions must uphold to ensure that all workers are liberated. Anything you want to add to this? Let me uh, build a little bit on what Kent's saying. You know, labor unions, as he said, you know, there, there are conservative elements within the labor movement, but to build on this question of immigrant rights, for a period of time in the 60s and 70s, labor unions, including Cesar Chavez, were in favor of deportation and uh, uh, using the INS to get rid of uh, Mexican immigrant workers. It took the work of progressive organizers within the labor movement, within the communities, to help unions articulate and understand that they needed to organize people regardless of their citizenship status. So the, you know, there really is an important role for people who have a progressive vision to engage with uh, organized labor, which is one of the few institutions in society that brings people together who don't necessarily like each other. They just happen to be working in the same place. And that gives unions the, the um, possibility of really changing people's minds through the, uh, the unionization process, through fighting together for things that we need, uh, for, that all of us need. Let me jump in here. I'm thinking back, we did a live stream, I don't know, many months ago. Uh, during the last couple of years, uh, my office has been working with a number of unions, often unions that were on strike and we try to provide the little help that we could. And we did a live stream like this. And we had, as I recall, workers on strike in Alabama. We had workers, mostly Latino, on strike in at a bakery in Los Angeles. I don't know, Kent, if you're familiar with that. Uh, that was rich products, I think, out there in, L in LA. Uh, we had workers in West Virginia on, on strike. We had a Starbucks worker who was organizing, whatever it was. And what was a beautiful thing to see is people nodding their heads when the other guy was talking. The same experience of corporate greed, trying to crush workers, take away their health care, deny them, you know, decent uh, benefits. Uh, talk to me, what I see and what I have seen in the last couple of years getting involved in these strikes is the importance of solidarity. I was just in, uh, there's a terrible strike going on right now. The, the company named CNH, uh, and they're in Racine, Wisconsin, and they're in Burlington, Iowa. Bad news strike. They really want to significantly reduce the health care benefits of their workers, many of whom work really hard during uh, the pandemic. And it was just a beautiful thing to see. We did a rally. It's like 93 degrees out in Iowa. And uh, these workers from the John Deere, company who had previously been on strike, came to express their solidarity with these workers. And this solidarity is a, you know, I know we got a philosopher among us right here, but it's a very profound statement. And what these guys were feeling and saying, without the union, we would be alone. And not only that, we're getting help from workers all across the country. You know, we can't make it on $200 a week strike benefit. And we're getting checks coming from other international unions. So I think that is not just a bread and butter issue. It is the sense that in a very difficult world, you're not alone. And I think that's fairly profound. All right, Mr. Philosopher Cornell, what do you think? You said it, fellow philosopher. I'm telling you. Solidarity says 
I see you. I feel your pain and I'm willing to take a risk to do something about it. I can't do it by myself. I can't do it alone. I've got to do it with others and in relation to you, human to human. See, that's why the trade union movement is always in the most profoundly humanistic effort in a predatory capitalist civilization to be committed to truth. The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. Here is our suffering and justice. You're going to lose your democracy if you don't treat working people fairly and allow them to have a voice in shaping their destiny. That to me is the best of, of, of the trade union movement, which to me is, is just the best of a humanistic movement. It's just that because it's a predatory capitalist society, you need a class analysis. Because it's a racist society, you need an analysis of white supremacy. It's a sexist one, you need analysis of gender. It's, it's a sec, it's settler colonial one, we have to be in solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters. So that's part and parcel of exactly what you just said. I can't say it any better, my brother. And you always do. <laughs> you, you already said it. All right, who else wants to jump in? I, I think this issue of solidarity, human solidarity, is so bloody profound. Kent, what do you, what do you? I, I totally connect with your uh, call for solidarity, Bernie. I totally connect with your call, Cornell, for hope. And uh, we need a worker-centered economy. We currently reside in a corporate-centered economy, a corporate-centered economy that is driving a race to the bottom in terms of uh, wages and working conditions, a That's corporate good. economy that is, uh, denying climate change and eliminating uh, practical steps that will save our planet, a corporate economy that is fueling the gun culture that is blocking any passage of meaningful gun control, uh, a corporate economy, economy that is ripping to shreds the rights of women and reproductive justice. So we need a worker-centered economy that can truly fulfill the solidarity mes message that uh, Bernie is bringing and the message of hope that uh, Cornell is bringing. Danny, you want to jump in on that one? Solid out. Yeah, I can jump in here. I think I uh, just kind of echo what everybody else has, has already said so beautifully, uh, so much better than what I could say. Uh, I think there's just something so powerful about seeing so many voices together kind of um, echoing the same kind of message. You know, we live in an age where everybody has their smartphone handy and we're always distracted by the next sound bit and the next, you know, scandal of, of who's doing what when. And I think whenever you have so many people standing together saying, hey, this is an issue, let's not forget that. It kind of focuses, forces everybody to focus in on what is being said instead of being drowned out by everything else that's going on. And I think that that's a really, really powerful thing to, to harness especially whenever we face so many challenges. So that's that's the big thing that I'd like to add here. Okay, Toby, jump in on solidarity. What does it mean? Well, it's, you know, it's... For movement, and that's one of the reasons why, of course, the anthem of the movement is Solidarity Forever, written in 1915 by Ralph Chaplin, who was a, a young man who grew up on a Kansas farm and became a migrant worker and and then got involved in one of the most dynamic and uh, radical uh, transformative union movements uh, of the time. Um, it's, it's an aspiration, it's a reminder, it's a prayer for all of us in a sense. Uh, and, and when union people sing it together, they feel solidarity in their bodies and that is the kind of transformative thing that uh, Cornell West is talking about. That is, is uh, it is embodied, it is spiritual, and it is it's in our minds. It changes our minds and helps us see a different world. All right. Uh, who wants to jump in with any parting thoughts? Anything a beautiful cacophony of voices, you know, the Black National Anthem is lift every voice. And these voices lifted today. Put a smile on Brother Martin Luther King Jr.'s face, let alone W.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson, and we haven't even got the, the, the Vito Marcantonio yet. I mean, you know, <laughs> we go. <laughs> Am 
my staff. If I just, I'd say that I really wanted to give a shout out to Bernie Sanders, to Cornell West for inspiring a new generation of young activists who are following you, following your leadership, following your vision for a society filled with more uh, hope and justice. And so uh, millions of young people all around the world have been inspired by you, Cornell West, and by you, Bernie Sanders. Thank you for the great yeah, work. Very kind. We're inspired by you, <laughs> Sister Dana, Brother Dover, You should have seen us on the campaign trail. I had to follow this guy all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> all right, listen, uh, I just want to thank you all for the great work you're doing. I think if there is a bright spot in a very difficult moment in American history, it is the degree, and, and Kent and others were talking about it, that the American people begin, are beginning to understand they've got to come together to fight for a peace for dignity, actually, and unions are an important way to do that. And it's just inspiring to me to see so many young people learn about trade unions and prepare to take on a corporate greed. So uh, let me thank uh, the four of you very much. I enjoyed this uh, live stream and look forward to continuing uh, the discussion with you. All right, thank you all very much for joining us. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you.